to our series of monthly uh, webinars on Agile topics. So the topic today is Architecture in an Agile World. And this is a really good topic. Uh, we've been meaning to do this webinar for a while, and I'm glad to bring it to you all uh, this month. So the, the issue that we run into many times in the Agile work is we, for the last 10 plus years of uh, Agile practice, we, most of us um, in the Agile community have pretty much uh, gotten convinced that evolving software requirements is a reality. And, and Agile is an excellent way to deal with that business reality of uh, evolving requirements. But the, but the part about how much upfront architecture and design to do is still somewhat of a mystery to most of the Agile team. There's a lot of questions and struggle around how much to design upfront and more importantly, what's the role of what used to be a software architect in, um, in uh, typical uh, waterfall type teams. So to tackle this question of what's the role, how much architecture and how to handle architecture in an Agile environment, I'm delighted to have an excellent presenter and um, a knowledgeable instructor, Don McGreal, with us. I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Don, but let me just cover some of the logistics for the webinar today. Uh, we will, we have an hour to cover the entire content. Uh, of that hour, roughly 45 minutes or so, will be prepared presentation that Don will walk us through. And then I'll keep track of the questions. If you guys have any questions along the way, and myself, I'm Heyman Talhan, CEO of uh, we host these webinars every month. I'll keep track of the questions and uh, inject those questions along the way if they if they make sense. And otherwise, we'll, we'll leave aside another 15 minutes or so at the end to answer questions, and we'll make um, the webinar uh, presentation available. Even the recording will be available on our website uh, shortly after the webinar, meaning the recording may take a few days uh, to process and be available. Let me introduce Don. Don is a VP of Learning Solutions at Improving Enterprises. Uh, he's a hands-on agile consultant and instructor. And as a consultant, he wears multiple hats, so he has a lot of credibility in covering this topic. He can he functions as developer, sometimes business analyst, and of course, most of the time, as an agile coach. And as an instructor, he has taught thousands of software professionals around the globe on various agile-related topics and software-related topics like um, acceptance testing, object-oriented design, test-driven development, and so on. And he's also, Don is also co-founder of tastycupcakes.org, which is a comprehensive collection the website with a comprehensive collection of games to facilitate agile adoption uh, in a very effective way. So with that, let me turn it over to Don. Don, um, over to you. Thanks, Samar. Um, I thought it was kind of funny. In my bio, I thought you said I, I was a handsome consultant, but he was... <laughs> Okay. Hands-on, <laughs> hands-on consultant. Yeah, much closer to hands-on than handsome. Um, well, well, thanks everybody. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, this is a topic that has come up quite a bit. Um, I do I do several I do a lot of agile uh, training and uh, technical training. I have a very technical background. I started with Java in, in 1995 and um, have kind of uh, kept up my technical. Um, experience along the way working with different clients all over the place. Um, I also do uh, Scrum Master training, Scrum Master certification training um, through scrum.org um, and it's a popular topic in that course too. So I've even brought in a few of the materials from the scrum.org uh, content as well um, that we'll look at here. So um, and then just quickly, Haman kind of gave you my overview thing. So just a, a couple of things. I'm with Improving Enterprises. We're based out of Dallas, Texas and that's where I am right now. In, uh, in Plano, actually, if anyone knows who that is. I, but we also have offices in College Station, um, partnered with the university down there. We do outsourcing to our office there, with, and we have a partnership with the university where we work with people. We also have offices in Columbus, Ohio, as well. And uh, we focus on consulting, uh, training, and uh, outsourcing. And one thing that binds us all together is, a, is our true belief in uh, building good software. It's not about being agile. It's just agile is a great way to get us there. Um, and then I also, like Kimont mentioned, I, I have a website called tastycupcakes.org. A little harder to do over um, um, digitally like this uh, when we're distributed, but I do a lot of hands-on activities, games, simulations, exercises to reinforce a lot of agile concepts. And there's this kind of a catalog of them all, and, and it's a community-driven thing, so a lot of people contribute. Um, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm with Scrum.org. This is Ken Schwaber's organization, the, who's the creator of Scrum, co-creator of Scrum. 
and I do professional Scrum Master certification through them. And I am a Canadian, also a very important point. I've been living in Texas for 12 years, but I was uh, born in Canada and lived there quite a bit. Um, and then moved down here in the year 2000, early 2000. A um, minute, this is uh, a little bit more about me. There's my wife and my two dogs. And then recently, um, we had one of these. This is our little girl, uh, Megan, her name is. And she was born on Leap Day this year, February 29th. So I was just joking with Haman earlier. Um, that means we only have to buy presents every four years, <laughs> which I don't think is going to be the case. Okay, so with that, let's get started. Um, this is kind of the agenda. I'm going to go over... Uh, what, wh how architecture is now a little bit different in the Agile world, what our expect how our expectations is, have changed. Uh, then it, it, an important part then is, you know, if we're jumping right into it in Agile, how do we reduce technical risk along the way? And what are the consequences? What is the risk of not paying attention to our architecture and our design? We'll talk a little bit about how teams are made up and the roles within a team and when it comes to architecture and design what the different rules are, um, how the architect fits into that. And then I'd like to finish with just a set of anti-patterns, um, just things to be aware of um, along the way uh, with architecture in general, not just necessarily in the Agile world. So uh, starting off, when we talk about software architecture, what I like to focus on first here is, is really what is the goal of, a, of an architect? What are they looking at? It's not just generically that they have to create a design document or um, pick what technologies we're doing and write a lot of UML. It is more that they have to focus on certain business goals. So just like we have the component from the business side and in Scrum you have the concept of a product owner. Um, what are the things that we need to focus on from an architectural standpoint? Um, it has to have some business value. If it doesn't, then there's no point in doing it. So what we'd like to, f to bring around all our architectural decisions back around to the business. And how do we do that? Well, uh, an important thing is to look at our non-functional requirements. These are the things we don't, uh, that, that aren't always obvious starting off, but a, a good architecture team is going to want to focus on these. If the business isn't thinking about them, then it is our responsibility to bring these things to the forefront. So you've heard a lot of like the ones on the left are all the abilities, usability, scalability, portability, on and on. Um, and then you've got security, performance, obviously, but also, you know, cost is an important one. Um, legal uh, pieces, uh, cultural issues, uh, internationalization. I mean, these are all types of things that the architect needs to worry about, the team needs to worry about because it can drastically affect um, the type of work that they're doing. You know, how are we going to make it so that it can swap between languages, per, uh, you know, or, or that we are following uh, guidelines online from a security standpoint, we're not going to get hacked. So uh, the business is going to be looking to us to, to help them identify these non-functional requirements. So we'll come back to this in a bit. Um, another conversation we get into quite, quite a bit in my trainings and when talking to customers is they like to compare architecture to building something like this, a house. And they say, you know, without a strong foundation, you're kind of, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be painting yourself into a corner. Uh, if you build this whole house and realize that the foundation wasn't strong enough, basically we have to tear it down, start again. And the cost of that is almost the cost of building the house to begin with. So that's, that's a, a common um, uh, thing that we hear coming out of uh, the, the design industry and the architecture industry. And it's valid to a point, but the reality is, is that building a house is, is, is a relatively simple concept if you think about it. We build how we've been building houses roughly the same way for um, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And we kind of know the end that we have in mind when we start. You could probably get one person that really knows the vision, really knows what needs to be done, and have them in charge of building this house. And then everybody else that comes in to build this can, ha can be divvied out tasks by this person and uh, work towards that vision. They don't necessarily need to know all the different ins and outs. The quality, honestly, of, of the people building the house doesn't necessarily have to be there either. Losing somebody building this house isn't going to be as drastic. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, on this, and this is this is this seems to work well when you know the end goal. But what if you're building something a little more like this? 
I don't even know what to call this. I just put question marks there. Um, I don't know what it's called, but it's pretty awesome. It, this is some kind of a, a Harley thing with a camper on the back, all kind of attached together. Now, the person that made this, think about the, the team that may have put this together. Uh, not so much uh, an individual, but maybe it was a team. Now, think about the things I talked about before. Do you think that the people that built this knew exactly what they wanted at the end? What do they, when they're describing this, how are they describing it? The house is easy. I want a house. Everybody knows what that is. But what is this? They're, in order to describe this, they're probably going to use um, they're probably going to use metaphors. They're probably going to compare it to a lot of other things out there, um, and they're probably going to talk more about their needs and not so much about the actual product at the end. They're going to talk about things like, "Hey, I want to um, drive in the open air. Um, I want the feeling of riding a motorcycle, um, but I also don't want to pay for hotels. I want to be able to go on long road trips and be comfortable in it." Um, I want to look cool is probably another one. So they're talking more about what they need, but they don't necessarily have a solution. So they talk about their needs and they don't really have a solution and they can't really envision exactly what this thing's going to look like. And do you think when they started that they're going to go down one path, they create one design and follow it perfectly? The reality is that they probably don't. The reality is that they go down certain paths, they realize, oh, you know, this is going to need more than one steel beam here. Um, we're going to need two axles on the back, not just one. But they learn this stuff as they go. But they have to adhere to certain design practices all along the way, not just up front. They have to, in order to get this to work, they have to do it. Otherwise, they go down a lot of wrong paths and they have to go circle back again. And uh, something else I mentioned with the house is, do you think the people, the skill of the people working on this has to be higher or lower than the people working on the house? I would assume losing one of your people that your key people working on this is going to be more drastic than uh, somebody that's building the house. It can't just be one person with the vision directing everything because it's complex enough that we need ideas coming from everywhere. We need empowered people working on this to build something as awesome as this. And there's going to be a lot of failure and a lot of dead ends and we have to be able to circle back and uh, fix and redesign and redesign and redesign. Does that mean that there was no upfront design? Absolutely not. They probably did. They probably put it down on paper what they needed to, looked at the parts they had, looked at their constraints, their budget, all of that, and then got going on it. But they probably didn't do it to the detail that the person with the house did. Why? Because they just didn't know. And any detail they put in there would be a, a crapshoot. They would be, everybody would know that there's no way we're following that. And any plan they put together, they know you may need to change along the way in order to achieve what they need to, rather than just blindly building something that may not even run. So my question then is, is that which are the two, the house or this cool chopper RV thing, is more closely related to your field of software development? Are we building things that we can exactly predict? Or are we building things to, to meet needs of our customers? That, and the customers don't know exactly what it's going to look like, what the product's going to look like. Um, so that we need to kind of go back at feedback and, and back and forth. So the, obviously the, the, the direction I'm heading in here is that we're not building houses. So we can't build a solid foundation because who knows what this is going to look like. We're building things that look, are more like this. And we have to do it in a way that will allow us to make architectural decisions throughout and not just at the beginning, because we know things will change. We've been dealing with this long enough in our industry. So that comes to this, um, the idea that for everything we build, um, the less we know about the technology, the less we know about the requirements, the less we know about the people we're working with, brings us closer to chaos. You see on the graph up here. So it's got three dimensions, uh, technology, requirements, and people. Chaos meaning very little is known. You Every day to day, you don't even know what's happening, what, what's, what you're going to be working on. Then bringing that in a little bit, maybe you have a little bit known, but there is more unknown than known. This is considered complex in this uh, one particular graph from the University of Hertfordshire. And, um, and then the more you get, the more you're familiar with your technology and your requirements, you get into this simple domain. And the, the question is, is that what are we mostly working on? Are we working on things where we're extremely familiar with the requirements and the technology and the people? If so, 
then that may be in that simple realm in planning complete design up front is quite possible. We may be able to do this just fine and work towards that. But the reality is that we're more in this complex realm, maybe even in chaos, but chaos is um, the first thing we want to do once you're in chaos is to just get, get a list of what needs to be done next and try to bring the project into complex, complex area. And over time, these things can change and move closer to um, the simple area. But we typically are in this complex realm. And the thing is, is we don't know most of what's out there. More is unknown than known. So what kind of process could we possibly create to build something that is more unknown than known? There's not one book, not one head that contains all the information we need. Not one design, not one requirements document that actually can spell out what it is that the customer truly needs. Not what they ask for, but what they truly need. And now we're asking to have a process for that. Well, that is what, um, that's what is defined in this little uh, uh, diagram here. We've got defined versus empirical. That in the defined world, what we're trying to do is predict the future. We, we think that we, all the initial information assumptions are valid throughout the whole planning horizon. We think it'll actually hold true, but the reality is um, it, it doesn't in all situations, but some do. Empirical is let's adapt to the future. This requires frequent inspection and adaptation. So empirical really means um, let's do something based off of some actual data, some true data. Um, and that's the approach we take for complex systems. If you don't know what things are going to look like at the end, then you have to get some empirical data. Let's do something. Let's do some work. And this isn't a new concept. This isn't, ad this isn't necessarily come from Agile. People in the waterfall world have been doing this. The idea of prototypes or whatever, just do some work, get some data, and make decisions based off of that. And we'll talk about how it's a little bit different in Agile uh, coming up. But that's what empirical is, and we're not the only industry. Um, when building houses, that's more the defined side. You can, the same inputs create the same outputs most of the time. Assembly line, construction, um, accounting, same thing. But there are other industries that are empirical that they can't predict outcomes. Sales, marketing, creative writing, weather predicting. The best they can do is give a prediction based on the data they have and then reevaluate over and over and over again. Um, they, and for them to not reevaluate would do a disservice to everyone. So if I was in sales, if I was selling vacuum cleaners and I predicted I could sell 10 vacuum cleaners a month this year. And uh, for the first quarter, I was only able to sell seven a month. Then it would, I would do a disservice to everyone involved holding to the same forecast. I would have to reforecast instead. And uh, so what we're saying is that the, what we build today is more like on the empirical side. The software development world is more empirical than it is defined where we can't just plan and then follow the plan. We have to plan, do, plan, do, plan, do um, constantly to get data and adjust as needed. That's the requirements, but we're also saying that's what we need to do from a design and architecture standpoint. Um, so this Scrum, if, if you guys may have heard of Scrum before, and we're going to use probably the most popular of Agile set of practices. This is a framework we can use. Um, and it was designed specifically for complex problems, for empirical, so an empirical way of dealing with complex problems. That's exactly what Scrum was invented for. And it comes with a set of activities and roles, and, um, and the goal every time is to produce something, a releasable increment. Now, the releasable increment says more about quality than it does about going to production. It would be great if we could deliver value to production every time. But this is more about the, the mindset that we have. Let's build something that shows value, but that, it, that can work, that could go to production if the business wanted us to. That will make it so that we don't, if we have a few bugs in there, or if we haven't met all our performance guidelines, but um, we're not going to worry about it because we're not going to production, then we forget about when we're going to do it. So saying that it's releasable makes, it, makes sure that we, we focus on the quality of what we're producing. So that's a big aspect of Scrum. Um, to look at it a different way, um, and by the way, I'm just going to go back a sec. So and it also, just to keep this in mind, because I'm going to come back to this, is that we start with a product backlog of all the things that have viewed specifically to the business. So these are all the features that we'll call. They can be user stories as a popular way of doing that. 
Um, but this is the product backlog that every sprint we create a sprint backlog of all the tasks to accomplish that. So I'll be talking about that context coming up. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, if I had this kind of a calendar here, let's assume these, this is uh, a month and these are weeks and uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So basically in Scrum, we're talking about the first, if you do a two week sprint, you should take no more than the first half day of the sprint for sprint planning. This is where we look at the product backlog and produce our tasks, our sprint backlog. And at the end, we do a sprint review. Otherwise, a lot of people call this the demo. This is where we show what we, uh, what we built and to get feedback and readjust. And then the retrospective, another important activity, which is how we learn and uh, how, we, how we adjust along the way, how we can do better the very next sprint. So these are built into Scrum. And then this little stars to represent after every single one of these are producing something of value. What I have in red here is the bare minimum you need to do. And oh, also one thing I didn't put in here, these are little red dash lines. These are the daily scrums, which a lot of you probably have heard of before. Um, usually when we talk about scrum, that's the one thing people think of. But there's a lot more to scrum than that. And we go to a lot of customers and we ask them that what they're doing. They go, we ask them if they're doing scrum. They go, oh yeah, we do them every day. But they don't think about all the other elements to scrum. So this is, this is everything in red here is the bare minimum in the Scrum framework. Teams have the ability to um, add to this, to extend Scrum any way they want. They can add value and be more agile um, however they need to, but they have to be doing what's in red here to consider it Scrum. Uh, uh, some popular things we've seen on the business side that the product owner struggles with from time to time is how much do I have to do before the first sprint on the requirements end? Um, and then how do I keep the requirements up to date along the way? So they, the, a common thing to do is to, on top of Scrum, add a little bit to this. So what I have in green here are optional in Scrum. And you may do more or less of this depending on your um, project. So maybe before the very first sprint, you take a day and you do your product backlog creation. You can size it. You can put together a release plan. There's actually a lot of stuff you could do here. Order the list. Order the product backlog. Uh, define acceptance criteria, and do some more of that. Do a little bit of it to, to have the initial product backlog before beginning the first sprint. That's a common practice. The other thing is then to keep this up to date, um, product backlog grooming, um, maybe a little bit of time set aside every sprint to just prepare the backlog for the next sprint. We would never want our product owner to enter a sprint unprepared. Um, and sprint planning with the team without knowing what's next on that product backlog and have broken it down. So the stuff in green are things we added, and this isn't how necessarily you have to do it. I've seen teams take product backlog room and do them every day for 30 minutes. They do 30 minute product backlog room meeting. Um, some teams will just do one hour on a Wednesday or something, but you know, I've seen teams do it this way too. One week is sprint planning for the sprint, the next Monday is sprint product backlog grooming and they can alternate. Also in the first part, when you build it, this depends. It's, I'm not saying just take a day, depending on your project and the uncertainty of the requirements and you know, if it's fixed price, you may need to do a little bit more work. But how much more work? You don't need to go all out and, and take a month for this is what we're saying. But you know, maybe a day, I've done day planning for a year long project and it works out just fine because we're building as we go. But if I'm on a fixed price project where we're getting paid for features produced, I may need to spend a little bit more time with the customer to hammer out a, a more detail. It's waste as far as development is concerned, but these contracts, pesky contracts get in the way. So we may extend this thing to maybe two days or you know, maybe a week, but I rarely would I ever go over a week to do something like this. We want to get going as soon as possible. So how does, how do we, how does this um, uh, fit in with architecture? Well, I would like architects and designers and the team themselves when it comes to design to be thinking the same thing. I have up top says big duff or little duff. That's big design up front is a common terminology, BDUF, um, where we, it from, comes from waterfall where let's design out everything we possibly can, which is the equivalent of building the foundation to your house. You haven't provided any value yet from the house's perspective, but um, but it's 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 building out that foundation. But like we talked about, we that's not what we're building. We're not building houses. It's impossible to predict. So, but should does that mean no design up front? 
So this is a this is a an argument I've had quite a bit where I get with people and they go, well, we have to do some design up front, and we go back and forth about whether we should design or architect or build out a foundation before we even begin. Ideas of things like Sprint Zero come up. Um, and which, by the way, is not a thing. In, it's not an official part of Scrum, but people use it. And but we go back and forth all the time. And then I just ask the question: Well, how much time would you need? And I surprise, I'm surprised often that it comes back with, well, I don't know, a couple of days, or maybe a week, but rarely is it more than that. Um, so all these conversations are kind of for naught. If you're only going to take a, a few days, then let's not worry about it. Do it. But that's little design up front. You know, even up to a week, and, and just like the requirements, it's going to depend. If you have a very risky technology, risky um, project, and a lot of unknowns, then maybe you spend a little bit more time designing up front than maybe another project. I can certainly see some projects that don't need to do any design up front and, and work just fine. Or the design they do is within the sprints, which is always the preference. So we'll, our early sprints will do a little bit more than our later sprints. So, um, so a little design up front can happen. Now, will one day work? I don't know. Your team should discuss that. How much time should we need? Which should probably be after we create our, our backlog. So we have an idea of what the requirements are from a very, very high level. But how much time do we really need? A day? Two days? So have that conversation with them to do the design you need up front before the very first sprint. Um, you can also create within your team working agreements. Uh, are we going to use continuous integration? Are we going to, how are we going to code this stuff? Are we going to put rules of, you know, how long a method should be and all that kind of stuff could happen first and before we even begin. But if not, it happens within the sprint. So that's kind of where we're getting at here is the idea that you can do, still do a little bit up front, but we're not spending months on this because the return on investment just isn't there. So back to our non-functional requirements. So how do we capture these things? Scalability, portability, maintainability, availability, accessibility, all this stuff. Where do they go? Well, we have options. In Scrum, you have the idea of the product backlog. So I've kind of uh, represented it here with these blue boxes. You know, little ones up top, big ones on the bottom, because we, the ones at the top, the most important ones, we've broken down into smaller pieces so we can consume within a sprint. Um, and so what do we do with them? Well, here are your options. You can capture them as acceptance criteria. So I would like you to look at every one of your features, your user stories, and ask yourself, do any of these non-functional categories apply? Is there security issues or portability? And if we're going to demo those as we build them within the sprint, then let's add it as acceptance criteria to that story. If you find that that acceptance criteria is showing up in every story or most stories, then a good idea is to add it to your definition of done. And we'll cover more on that later. But the definition of done is exactly um, acceptance criteria for every story, which means we can't say that story is complete for doing it within a sprint until um, it passes its performance tests and security tests. And this is extremely important because if, we're not, if we haven't defined this, then what we end up with may not be what the customer expects. We could say, yeah, it's done. Oh, I mean, it doesn't perform yet, but we'll do that eventually. No, it, it, it's an important thing to do up front to design. It. It'll also affect how much of the backlog that's the team's willing to, to commit to for a sprint. That can affect their forecast drastically. They thought they could do eight stories in a sprint. And uh, then we say, well, no, this also includes security, encryption, and all that. And that might be, that might change that forecast. It might go, well, if it includes security, we can only do six, not eight. So it just gets everybody on the same page and keeps it more transparent. If we don't want to make it part of definition done, maybe it's too complex to do for every single story, um, but we want to get it done eventually, then the other option is to make it its own story. Each of these non-functional requirements has importance to the um, product owner, to the business. So if one of them is support documentation, so that for the people that support it afterwards, or um, load testing, uh, then that can be done. You would just place it and prioritize it with everything else. It could be Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. It could be any of those non-functional requirements, and it'll be up to the, up to the team and the architects and the designers to, to work with the product owner to prioritize them along with everything else. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just focus on the value though. We ask why when we write user stories. Why is, why is supportability important? Why is security important? And that should have a business value out of it. Okay, so we add them to there. 
and then what you end up with is it is very common or very um, uh, 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 possible, I should say, that you uh, you will spend a lot more time on your infrastructure stuff in early sprints. So let's not use the idea of a sprint zero. Let's build something. Let's find something on that product backlog that's important to the business, a, a very valuable piece, but it, maybe it's very small, something we can produce while we're still fleshing out our infrastructure and our architecture. So in this little graph we show in sprint one, we may use the majority of our capacity working on infrastructure stuff. So we inflate early stories to be able to adapt, for that, adapt to that. So we might produce something extremely small and then we'll build something big. I was with a, um, a customer in our very first sprint. And after four weeks, we were doing four week sprints and it was a, uh, it was a printing company. So we could actually produce, um, we were, we were uh, having people upload files, put printing and finishing options, selecting stores, uh, all, uh, it went on and on and on, all the things that this product, it was pretty big, it was a year long project. But our very first sprint, all it was was uploading a file and we had a cool little Ajax thing that gives percentage complete. And for the work, that's what we demoed. And they were happy. They were ecstatic because they never got any kind of functionality that early before. And, uh, but we had been able, we were able to prove out a good chunk of our architecture and infrastructure during that first sprint as part of that. We still look for something in the backlog to provide value, very important. Um, then over time, and you can communicate this to your customers, that over time you'll get to a point where you're then delivering more functionality than actual infrastructure work. There'll always be some infrastructure work, but it would be less. Now, one of these is a little bit different. So we talked about all these ones here that show pretty immediate value to the customer. Usability, scalability, portability. I can ask that pretty quickly, but there's one that's quite differently different and, and quite a, it's ignored too much, certainly by the business. It's maintainability. This is making it so that our system is going to be much easier to maintain. So how do we deal with this? And what is, what's, what's the repercussion if we don't worry about maintainability? And who should be responsible for thinking about maintainability? Um, this is, should be our most important architecture goal from the architect side. I would expect the business will be pushing us on all the others. The architect has to worry about this a lot right? because the, um, I don't know if you've seen some of the statistics out there, but I've heard 80% of the cost of software is in maintainability. We tend to budget for building a product and then we worry about maintainability after the fact but this is what some of the most important pieces. Our systems exist for 10, 20, 30 years. I bet some of you out there now are working on these types of projects, um, but, and they're maintained by hundreds of people. This is the cost, the true cost of everything we do. So who's responsible for this? This should be the team is responsible for this one main non-functional um, requirement. We can't expect the, pro the business to put uh, their uh, much effort and cost and value on this as the team does. Um, so that gets us into the next section, which is reducing the technical risks. Because here's what happened. If you do not pay attention to maintenance, then slowly over time where the top is, is the time you're spending on feature development that the business cares about, the bottom is the time you spend struggling with the complexity of the system that you're working with. So it ends up looking like this, where eventually you get to a point where you, you're wading through mud because of the system is such so ugly. It's a huge legacy system where you just can't deal with it. You, it. The cost of producing anything is so high because we haven't worried about maintenance. And teams, pro, all products suffer from this one way or the other. It's impossible to have no technical debt, which is what we're call, calling this. And by the way, this comes from scrum.org's uh, PSM certification course. Um, this is some of the stuff we cover in that. And this is how we talk about technical debt. If every sprint we're not worried about maintenance and, and there's a lot of forms of technical debt, anything we, we, say, we thought we, were, we should have done as part of a story and we didn't, that's technical debt. If there's a defect that came up later on, that's technical debt. We should have had that covered. If we, if we didn't pay attention to performance and everybody thought it was part of it, we have to eventually. So all these undone things just kind of snowball over and over again. It makes it much, more, much harder to work with it. So that's technical debt in an unhealthy team. What ends up if you have too much debt? Over time, you go technically bankrupt. This is when you make statements like, you know what, at this point, I think it's better just to rewrite the whole thing. Let's file chapter 11 on this thing because it is done. And uh, we basically have to start again because we've created so much debt. It speaks to a lot to uh, the country I'm in right now and probably most of the world actually. 
But uh, so this is where we are. And this is what we end up with as well is this huge mess. Um, this is from a TV show, Hoarders. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that, but um, this, is, this is what we're trying to avoid. When you end up with a kitchen looking like this, then you throwing an extra sock on there or something isn't going to make that much of a difference. And so you tend, it tends to grow much easier once it looks like this. Um, there's an idea of called broken window syndrome and we don't maintain along the way. And uh, it's, it's, it was a test, it was a study that was done years ago where they would have a building with windows on it. It was an abandoned building full of windows and it would be fine for weeks. But the moment they broke one of those windows, then uh, the next day, all the windows were broken. It was graffiti, it was vandalized. And people feel once something's messed up, that it's not that big of a deal to mess it up some more. And I've experienced this um, with customers. Uh, I remember pairing with somebody, a developer, and after they added like the sixth nested for loop to this one uh, bit of code, I asked, I, I've said, well, maybe we want to think about doing that a little bit differently. What if we broke that into and uh, refactored it a little bit, put in another method? And, and he kind of laughed it off and said, really? You think that's bad? You should see the rest of this system. And that's kind of this. I think of this when we get there. And this is what we want to avoid because this is irresponsible, um, especially if there are other people working in our area that they have to be, go in and wade through it. To get anything done is impossible. And this is what technical debt looks like. So if you had a friend that was in debt, let's say credit card debt, what would you tell them to do? What's the first step? People typically say, let's cut up the credit card. So that's number one. Stop creating debt. Don't use your credit card anymore. So stop it. So we'll talk about how to get to that. And then step two is make small payments. Um, every single payment period, put a little bit more money into um, your debt and then just keep repeating from step two every sprint and don't create any more debt but then pay them off so what does that look like in our world well in our world you, you, you identify definition of done we talked a little bit about this before but let's make sure we're aware of what the definition of done is definition of done is our way being adhering to definition of done is our way of cutting up our credit card let's just make sure what we mean when we say something is done and this can apply at many different levels, uh, four levels to be specific. And we'll start with the tasks. So every task that you do, and this is more on the developer side, let's all come together and figure out what does this mean? When, when somebody says their task is done, is it unit tested? Is it code reviewed? Is it checked in? Where is it checked in? Um, is it, does it adhere to the style guide that we agreed to as a team? Once we've got this in place, this is the, our way of not creating any future debt from the task level. Then, and this is something you can do before your project even begins, and it should evolve too. You should grow with it. And what about a feature, a story? When is a user story actually considered done? Is it the acceptance test passed? Is it on the test server? Where does it live? Is it just on my machine? Is it on the dev environment? Let's just make sure we know where it is. Um, has it been performance tested? And you can attach any um, of the non-functional ones to this. And you can get your product owner involved in defining definition of done for stories they should at least be aware of what they're seeing at every demo or when you say a sprint is done. Then a step up from that, we're talking about the done sprint. This is the increment of work that we've finished within the sprint. Is it versioned? Is it in user acceptance testing? And that's, this is just an example. You maybe don't have a UAT environment, um, but you have some other environment you'd like to go to at the end. Maybe you go to production every sprint. Is it integrated with other teams that you're dependent on working on this? Um, has it, do you have training part, as part of it? Have you updated support documentation, release notes? Um, let's all get these things down because everything we don't do is, is, is gets put into the technical debt column. And then it, finally, it's the release. When is it actually, when is it ready for uh, production? Has it met our compliance things, our Sarbanes-Oxley compliance stuff, our regulatory things? Um, has it been labeled? Have we done training on it? and on and on and on. So this is an important thing. I usually draw up a board, a quadrant of all four of these things and then facilitate this, the creation of definition of done by having the team fill in what done is for every category. And this is a great way of cutting up that credit card and not creating any future debt. So that's definition of done. Now, but what if you have done that and now it's time to, if you cut up your credit card, now you wanna pay off the debt. So you may have seen something like this before, like a task board. This is just to visualize the work within a sprint. So this team may be working on three features and they break them down into quite a few tasks and they move them across the board. And when all the tasks are done, the thinking is that the feature is complete. Um, now, if I have debt though, 
I want to make sure, if I want to make sure we're doing something about it, then let's, let's reserve some of our capacity for paying off our debt, which means we may have to deliver less features, but this is important in the long run, like we explained before. So maybe I take one of these swim lanes that was reserved for features and change it, turn it into an engineering lane so that we can track all these this work. I've had to do this before for teams that were in debt and, and realized that, and they just wanted a good way of tracking this stuff. So if you look, and I've also added, like even for existing features, we start to add um, technical debt type things. This is how it, you should never have to create this engineering lane if you're starting out. Ideally, all these, all these activities you're doing to get out of debt or to not create debt should be as part of each feature. So the example in feature one here is we have a design task. Feature two, we have an upgrade task, meaning let's, while we're doing this feature two, let's upgrade the framework that we're relying on for this feature or um, this library or this um, technology. And that could be part of that feature. That certainly should be part of it. And if you keep doing that, you should never have to pay off debt. This lane, this red lane here, has to be done if you have existing debt. Maybe you're inheriting a system, or maybe you, were, you, you ended up helping create the system, but it's done. It is already a technical debt. So we're not going to fix it as part of other features. We've got to get this stuff done so that we can pay off our debt. So you would, you know, in here we have an engineering task, maybe a bug from a past feature that should have been fixed. That's the maintenance side of it. Um, an upgrade to something over here, another engineering task, refactoring, all kinds of examples that you can do here. Um, we want to, you know, move away from this COBOL system and produce a uh, web service and, and all that kind of stuff. Although that could be done as a feature that's going to be using it. But if it's just done simply um, as an overall re-architect, then you can put it into this, this kind of a link. And you're not going to get velocity points for this because this is paying off things that should have been done in the first place. So if you're familiar with the idea of velocity and story points, we're not going to worry too much about that in this lane because this is stuff we just have to do. The result is we're going to get less points for here, but that's reflection of the reality of our situation. We are doing less for the business um, right now because we have this debt and we have to pay off for it. Once it's paid off, our velocity can go up, and that's the type of situation we're trying to create. Hey, Don, can we take one question on this particular topic before you move Absol off on the technical Absolutely. debt? Yep. So there's a question about uh, uh, what are some strategies for identifying technical debt uh, so I guess along the lines of complexity that you talked about earlier in the uh, presentation, is there a way to uh, to categorize debt and so you can prioritize which debt to handle when? Yeah, so that's that's interesting. Um, it, it, what, what I've done with teams is, so we have the idea of a product backlog, which is features. What you don't want to do is put your technical debt things into the product backlog because you want to keep that pure business. You want the business owning that. But the team can certainly make their own list of technical debt um, things, things that around the system they all want to do. And this happens, this shows up all the time. You know, we, this is a nightmare to work in. Let's upgrade this. Let's do this. Let's do some code reviews so we can actually figure out what this list of things is. And then as a team, let's prioritize it. Let's prioritize this list. And then every sprint, let's take a few of them off and add to this swim lane down here of those. What are we looking for? Well, I'd be looking to some of the leaders in that uh, within the team to kind of identify that, but they should know. I mean, the, the, if there's complexity, let the team decide. Let them figure out what's the most important things to them. Um, there, we, we will be talking a little bit about code smells coming up as well. Um, and uh, those are things to look for, uh, things that make things less maintainable. But just like I talked about the, the house versus that RV chopper, the type of people that are on a team for RV Chopper have to be able to identify these things. They have to be able to see the weaknesses in what they're creating, and they have to be empowered to fix those things. If you take a bunch of workers and expect to give them a bunch of tasks to build you something that complex, then you're going to be running and you're going to be creating debt. It's going to be hard to identify. It will be very hard to identify. So, you, so this does rely on, as does most of this stuff, is any, well, any empirical system on the quality of the people to be able to identify what's bad, what's going to make it difficult along the way. And, um, and, then, and then this is a process you can follow to actually attack it. Um, yeah, I hope, hopefully that answers the question. And may, coming up as well, we're going to be talking a little bit about good design right here, actually. So these yeah. are the things to look for from a maintenance standpoint. Okay. So 
a lot of th things, design patterns, first of all, does not make it good design. Design pattern is a, something you can use. It's a tool. It's a tool you might use along the way, but you should be able, you don't just use that as your recognition of it, what makes it for a good design or a bad design. Um, good design comes down to just two core aspects. In fact, I, I, I challenge you to think about one design pattern you've ever heard of or one decision around there that doesn't map to one or both of these two core aspects of good design. And they are low coupling and high cohesion. These are the absolute top things we're going to be worried about. Low coupling, meaning we don't want to be making changes that affect things all over the place. And high cohesion is uh, making things have a single responsibility. This comes a little bit from solid, right? The first one, single responsibility, where uh, we know exactly where to go to get things done. On this, and every single pattern comes down to this, and this is how we make things more maintainable. And the balance that we have to strike between them is key, because you could go crazy on your coupling, but that could create less cohesion. And extreme cohesion can create more coupling. So you have to kind of follow the balance, and that's what a designer has to do. Same thing, you look at bad design, you've got duplication, ambiguity, and complexity. These are the key things we want to focus on here. Um, and uh, so look for these in your code. This is any, any forms of this, is, this is um, technical debt. Is it in multiple places? A stored procedure that's kind of duplicated with some small changes, that's duplication. Ambiguity, it's not very clear of what it is. The naming has been off. Or complexity, long methods, complex methods. Um, that makes it harder to maintain. Every bad design comes down to this, smells. These are, this is what creates smells. And there's a whole, I won't go over all of these, but there you can, in the refactoring book by Martin Fowler, uh, that I think was written in 96, 97, they cover some bad smells, and you can find these ca categorized this way online too. But these are things to look for. So if you're looking for technical debt, check, look for these, and, and find, have, have plans to fix them. Or just fix them when you see them, if you can't do it. If it's, it takes longer than a few hours, then add it to your list. So how do we get there? Well, that's where the refactorings come from. You've heard of refactoring, refactoring to patterns, towards patterns, but sometimes away from patterns. These are the steps that you need to do to actually um, fix it. So you can take these composite refactorings and add it to your list of things that need to be done um, to get your system to where it needs to be. And this is going to be a slow process, but an important one to follow. You're not going to pay it off in one sprint. Um, and then finally, we, or, or actually not finally, but we'll get into to team makeup and rules. We, we advocate a lot in the Agile world about teams that are vertical, that build something completely. This is key because um, if we do, if we have teams for each layer, a presentation team, business team, and a database team, then the business to get anything done has to, it's, now they're highly coupled. They have to go talk to a bunch of different groups. So teams are vertical. And from an architecture standpoint, it is extremely key. Because now you have a, a, a completely cross-functional team that have what they need to make the design decisions they need to. Within that, all the features and stories that, you, that each team produces should be vertical slices as well. That way you can show things that are complete. So what we're trying to avoid here is doing things like, well, we'll just build out the presentation layer, but not do anything. Let's, state, let's fake out the data, database layer, or let's not do a real UI yet. Anything that's not done is technical debt. So we want to build something completely. That's how we keep the quality high, and that's how we focus on um, architecture. Um, how you, in, in the same way is the ideal team composition is, I don't care how your company is organized, uh, if they're siloed or what, but in an agile world, we would cross silos. We would love to have you know, multiple QA, dev, architect, and DBA right on the team so that we can focus on all that, completely cross-functional, even better cross-functional individuals on the team as well that could jump do different roles if they needed to. Even if it's not at the same speed, it gets, it gets us doing, mo moving more towards the right direction. Uh, but unfortunately, this isn't always the, um, re this isn't always reality, it's always possible in certain organizations. This is ideal though. Um, but what do we do when it's more like this? You don't have a DBA that can support a team or one DBS to support many teams. You have an architect group um, for whatever reason. We'll talk about those a little bit later. What do you do with those in this situation? And this gets into the specialist role. Ideally, we want them on the team. More realistic, though, it's like this. And we'll talk about how a architect or others can plug into a team. And we're going to focus more on the architect, but this can apply to any specialist. Worst case is that they don't participate, they don't care about scrim, they Scrum, they don't care about anything about how that team is working. This is typical with third-party vendors. 
And uh, in that case, you would have to have somebody actually on the team take responsibility for going out and pulling information from those specialists. That's the worst case scenario. But more realistic is this number two. So let's talk a little bit more about that. And by the way, lots of different roles for architects that are out there. So it really depends on what your architect does. Um, but ultimately, it's how do they fit into what we were talking about. So the stuff in red is the base scrum framework. Green are from the requirements side, things we should add. And then this orange could be, you know, upfront design. And maybe you could even do design sessions throughout as well if you need it. But where can an architect plug in? If this is an architect that isn't on a team, which the reality is you probably prefer them to be on the team, then, um, they're, but they're on the outside for whatever reason, then they can plug in with sprint planning. They could go in there and they can work with the product owner to get the non-functional things in there to make sure the team's dealing with risk. And then you can use the review. You could lean on the review a little bit where you do your typical demo with the business and then maybe reserve a little bit of time with the architect and just go over what we did for that sprint from an architect standpoint. Show where we went, how we did it, and even the retrospective of how we can improve the architect architecture from now on. This is if you have, you're in an organization that has these architect roles, kind of breathing down your neck, making sure that you're dealing with constraints within the organization and all that. Um, and so you have the ability to plug in. Scrum is great because it allows, it's a framework and you can plug in and mix out of these things. You can't change what's on there, but you can add to it as much as possible. Um, so it's, it, it's perfect for those types of specialist roles that can come in and, and do that. So, um, and kind of just to wrap up here, um, I have a few of these anti-patterns and uh, I, I may spend more or less time on some of them just to, to get through this. I'm gonna probably wrap up in the next two minutes. But um, obviously this first one is key, it deals with coupling a lot, is the logic in the wrong layer anti-pattern. Uh, think about what would need to change if other layers were modified. I had a customer, um, it was actually somebody in class that says, no, I don't agree with this emergent architecture kind of idea because we didn't think about it up front and now we're totally dependent on Oracle. We created, we have a database and um, now we wanna get out of it, it's costing us too much, we wanna move to a different database, but we can't. So to me, that's not a problem with it, the fact that you didn't design enough up front, that you didn't plan enough. To me, it's a, it's, a, it's a poor decision that was made along the way. Not that we went with Oracle, but how you became dependent on Oracle. So as soon as that statement was made, I realized that there's probably more to it. So you start to ask questions about why you're dependent on Oracle. Why can't you just swap the database out and put another one in? Um, why haven't you created it, an interface layer between the two? And the reality was that they went down with stored procedures and they created a whole lot of business logic on the database. So they cross layers with this. So for them to swap it out, the stored procedures don't map as easily from database to database. Now they're completely coupled to the database itself. Um, so make sure your logic's in the right layers to so make this a lot easier for things to happen. So your presentation layer, no business logic in there. Um, you have other layers in between that kind of do the controller side for swapping them back and forth, integration for, for database access or um, external access, maybe even a shared layer that uh, all the shared components live in. Um, no architecture vision. This is another, um, just because we're agile doesn't mean we don't do anything up front. We don't have this idea of where we're going architecturally. So if you have an architect, that's fine. But if not, somebody on the team or the team should be creating this vision, a single architecture vision well-defined and communicated, and it should ch and it may change. This is where your constraints could be placed. This should be, in everything we do, it should be brought out. It should map to the business goals and objectives. Like this is a huge security is our number one problem here, or maintenance or whatever. All decisions should be made within this with this vision in mind. This is the type of thing that should be communicated before we even begin. So if you think about that LDEF, light, the light little design up front, this is something that can be communicated then. Swiss Army Knife, trying to build a system thinking that you can predict everything is impossible. It's been shown time and time again. Um, that's what we try to do. We think we're building a house. So the foundation we create is because we know things change so much in our industry. So our foundation, we, we build it so that we think we can, we can, it could be a house, it could be a skyscraper, it could be something else. So we go crazy with this thinking up front about it. But the reality is with the technology these days, we would start a little project just the same way we would start a big project. If I was building a website, I could create my foundation. What I begin with is going to look the same as if I went with a complete clustered enterprise solution. 
um, if I follow the .NET stack or the Java stack or whatever, um, Ruby, they have solutions these days. The technology is at a place where I'm going to start it the same way with coupling, cohesion, layering, and all these other patterns in mind. A couple of things, I'm, I won't get into details here, but some of my nastiest architectural problems in my my career have been threading and, and caching. Um, threading where people think for performance reasons they start going with threads and this creates the single most difficult maintenance nightmare you get. And, and the, 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 bad, the sad part is it's not normally necessary. Your application frameworks these days deal with it. So ever thinking about creating a, a thread or as soon as you start to spin a thread, be careful it's not enough thread to hang yourself with because um, it, it can get you into some nasty problems. Um, testing becomes extremely hard. Um, caching as well. Um, do we even need a cache? Do we even need a database? May, don't start thinking that you ha you need to have a complete database for everything out there. Um, I used to think that. And I've had database people tell me, no, no, it's too difficult to change later. You have to tell me everything now. Until I start working with more agile-minded database people. It's more about the solutions you provide, the ability to swap between databases, add columns, whatever it takes, without losing all the data in there. You can do that. There are ways of writing scripts and, and uh, maintaining a database as effectively um, as your code. And uh, ivory tower architect, the architect that thinks that they're on the outside and they're going to tell the teams how to build it and go from there. Um, whereas anyone that's played a design role before or an architect role knows that your first design is never the best. It's a good idea to start there, but you have to actually be actively coding on it to make the decisions needed to move forward. So the idea that you can have an architect on the outside, and these could be brilliant architects. And unfortunately, good developers, when they move up, they become architects, and um, that's their management position, and they can't go any further. Uh, from it, so they spend their time doing doing this, and they're not working on day to day with teams, but they need to in order to make the right decisions. So this doesn't work. And unfortunately, ivory tower architects that are passionate about building stuff, they may go to the next piece where they might have a, get it in them that they can build these great custom frameworks for all the teams, and uh, we'll make it easy so that we'll build these frameworks. And I've had customers build their own collections framework, uh, their own threading frameworks all these different things to make the and have the teams and force the teams to use them. But the problem is who updates them? Who pays to maintain these things? Who will upgrade it when like we had this happen with the collections framework, we couldn't move to Java 5 because uh, the, the framework was written in Java 2. So uh, we were completely stuck with it until and there was no budget to upgrade the framework itself. So custom frameworks rather than off the shelf things, there's a lot of great off the shelf solutions certainly now. So. To sum all this up, um, agile and our agile architect builds plans and foundations that embrace change. This is happening every day now. Um, from the requirements side, we've had to deal with this to realize there's absolutely no way you're going to be able to cover everything that's going to happen. We're not building anything that's been built before. If there was, we would just copy it or you know buy it, whatever we need to do. So, what kind of an architecture design? is going to work here. Well, the, the good news is that today's technologies allow us to do this. It gives us this flexibility. The problem is we're not taking advantage of them. Um, we do things like write store procedures and mix up our business logic in different areas, and we're not taking advantage of what's out there. Um, if, you, if you make a decision to go .NET or Java, which is probably your original part, you need to do that before you even begin, probably. Um, but once you start down that road, those other decisions happen along the way. What, what, whether we need a database, well, let's wait till the story comes up that has some data persistence, and we'll worry about it then. We'll have some idea, or maybe there's a database there. What about constraints that the rest of the organization has on our architecture? Add them to the backlog, because those have value from the business perspective. Um, so w we just need to be able to take advantage of these, and I think our bigger problem isn't about whether we're agile or not. It's whether we're following good practices of coupling, cohesion, and good object-oriented practices. Unit testing, which I didn't get really into here, but test-driven development. I did another talk on that that you might be able to read about, but that's key from a quality perspective. From quality perspective. Um, you can write your design as you go. Test-driven design in that sense. So that's kind of the the overall um, summation of, of uh, what we're trying to get to here. And with that, um, we may have a few minutes here for some questions. I'm not sure, Haman. Hopefully, I left you enough time. Um, sure. But thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Don. So let me 
Now, so folks, uh, you have a chance to, uh, in fact, but I won't change presenters. Uh, Don, if you can sit through the pages, I'll do a quick intro to Synergy, and then we'll take a couple of questions before we wrap up. Um, so the next few pages, just sit as in a nutshell, we host this webinar uh, and agile topics once a month. We are a software development partner for small to mid-sized technology companies and we follow agile practices. Uh, so I think most of you, most of you on the webinar, I think know us, but those who don't, welcome an opportunity to chat more with you. So just take at least one question that I think you covered, uh, Don, in the beginning, I think in your uh, iteration zero when you touched upon one question that is how much of data model design to really do up front uh, there's a lot of challenge teams face which is in not doing when they don't do enough design they feel like they need to they will end up having a lot of rework down the line so they end up feeling like they need to do a lot of data model design at least up front can you advise how to so, deal with that challenge I've, I mean, I've been involved in a lot of modeling, domain modeling, um, and data modeling as well. And I, I've tried doing it for a whole project before, and I come up with something. But then on the same, and just by myself, and then on the same project, do it sprint by sprint. <clears throat> it helps a lot when you can certainly see, we know what our product backlog is. So you can sort of see where we're heading from an overall project. We don't have complete blinders on past the first sprint. We have an idea. We have a backlog of where we're going with all of this. But only focusing on one sprint at a time is extremely liberating. And as long as you develop it in a way that's, that's uh, maintainable, object-oriented, it, it isn't that big of a deal. And I've found when I've modeled one sprint at a time and then compared it with this growing emergent model to the one I built originally, the one I built originally was, was crap. It was not the right one that we would have done. But approaching it small steps at a time and only focusing on what we're needing to produce completely for a sprint works. People are doing this all the time. Um, you can think about the future, certainly, but it, to anything you produce now, either in the model or in requirements or actually in code that isn't being used right away is considered waste. <clears throat> so the, what we're saying is that if you do it right, then it shouldn't be painful. There shouldn't be so much rework later on. It, the rework happens when we head down the wrong path and we don't pay attention to our maintainability. Excellent. Thank you, Don. I think we have overshot the time, but I think it was an excellent presentation and we got a number of questions that we'll just have to cover in an encore version of this webinar. This is a very a good topic. So thank you again for all of you for participating and thanks, Don, for doing an excellent job of, on this topic. We'll thank see you, you next much. month at a webinar. It, thanks, Great. Thanks. Bye.